Hello, everybody. Atma Namaste. Atma Namaste, ma'am. Yes, so I'm hoping today we shall finish with this uh, chapter. Let's close our eyes. Let's get ready uh, while the others still join in. Inhale and exhale, relax your body. Feel yourself in the presence of the Supreme Being, the Divine Father, the Divine Mother. In the presence of all the great teachers, especially Lord Mahaguruji Meli, our beloved teacher, Grand Master Chua, all the teachers and the masters of theosophy, to Buddha Kuan Yin, Buddha Sakyamuni, Gautama Buddha, to the Lord Christ, to Lord Yehoshua Ba Miriam, to Lord Shiva, to Lord Ganesha, to the host and angels and great beings of light, knowledge and wisdom, to our soul and divine self, we humbly ask for your great, great blessings, for your divine light, for your divine love, for your love, for your mercy, for your guidance, for your divine protection. We especially ask you to help us to be open and receptive to your priceless teachings, to all the knowledge and wisdom being imparted to us today. We ask you to help us to absorb and assimilate this deeply, make it part of our lives, to help become better divine instruments to serve you. We offer ourselves as instruments to do your work. With thanks and in full faith, so be it. Atma, namaste. I hope all of you are doing well. Did you miss Sri Rama and I in the morning? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, but at least you, could, you could have slept uh, for a longer period of time today because of that. <laughs> no, no, you both became a family member of us. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're so used to seeing us early in the morning. Yes, somewhere. Yeah, okay. Every morning we are seeing though, you became family members. <laughs> Yes. The students That's true, to me. Today I started my meditation at eight forty-five. <laughs> well, only forty-five minutes late. It's okay. You got extra. Uh, but still, uh, at yeah. least you started. You continued. You proceeded. You didn't stop. That's very important. Uh, students, I got up at seven o'clock rather than yeah. six o'clock. Okay. Thank you to me. We are continuing with the eight to ten sessions. We are nearly seven and eight of us. And we have decided to continue Fabulous. Our, with the AY practice. <laughs> but the, all, all the credit goes to you and Sri Ram. Not to us, actually, just World Pranic Healing, trying to do this and definitely IS because uh, we are not allowed to play any of these audios until and unless we get written permission. Okay. So Sri Ram and I actually got written permission to actually play the audio, including the Blue Triangle, the Morning Sadhana. So you'll notice that we don't do it otherwise. Uh, the other thing that we've got permission now till the 17th of May is to do the Twin Hearts. And that's why we do the Twin Hearts online. After that, I cannot do it till I get authorizations further from IIS. Yeah, so Manila has to give us authorizations to take it further. So please remember, you need to also follow the same thing. Yeah? Sure. Okay, so uh, we oh stop. My. Oh, yeah. So let's just go back to uh, just a little bit before we continue. Yes, um, the, the topic is coming to an end with reference to hopefully uh, the bodies that we are referring to at this point. Yes. Um, now, when we look at an ordinary person, normally when they move out of their physical body, they let go of this physical body and move into their astral body. Most of them hopefully are not rearranging their astral matter. Correct. So that's what we were talking about. And uh, when they're conscious, they are conscious usually in the lower levels. And so most ordinary people lie, their consciousness lies in the sixth, I mean. partially the seventh. The seventh being the lowest, which is usually under the physical uh, earth, as we call it. Because in the astral world, there is no earth as in hard uh, physical matter. But they are in the densest part of the astral matter where it's almost like darkness uh, most of their life. Yeah. So now the... Ego, the higher soul or the ego, as it says in this uh, book, 
say for example, this is your physical body. It's starting to withdraw. The physical body is gone. And then now you're in your astral body, right? But even in the astral body, after a certain time, it will start to withdraw. So before I go ahead, let me mute you. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll give you some time. Hopefully we'll have some time at the end. All right. So to continue. So in time, it is also going to withdraw from this astral body. Yes. And so we have a couple of points more in the astral body before I move into the next body. Yes. And so in the astral body, uh, the average man, as time passes on, finds the earthly surroundings. Yes. So even though, remember, we were talking about the seventh and the sixth, the sixth level of the astral plane is very similar to the physical world that we can see. And so most people, majority of people get, uh, get aligned with this matter or this subdivision of the astral world. However, in time, they start noticing that the surrounding, the earthly surrounding around them, they start losing interest and the world around them also starts becoming very dim. So this starts to happen to them and then they slowly start moving out as well. It becomes, in, uh, it becomes dimmer and things that they attach to in the physical world. Yes, uh, maybe their house, maybe their office, uh, maybe certain family members, certain things that they made, uh, which is very dear in their life. They start losing interest in them. They find that it is not so important. Yes. Now we are talking about emotionals, emotions only. We're not talking about, uh, we're not talking about anything mental yet. Yes. So anything that they are physically attached to or emotionally attached to, slowly they realize there is no need to keep this uh, connection going and slowly the world uh, loses interest and it becomes dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. Now at this point, they start to uh, move upwards into the higher levels, right? So remember we spoke uh, yesterday of uh, the other levels. Let me just go back there. So we spoke about these levels yesterday. Just move you down. Yeah. And so you're talking about the seventh where hopefully not many people are going, uh, which is total darkness in that uh, subdivision. The sixth, sub sixth subdivision is where most people go. And then they slowly move into the fourth and the fifth and the world around them slowly starts losing interest. Yes, they don't feel the need to be connected. They don't need the materialistic things around them. And slowly they move into the top three layers. And the top three layers is is the one that you want to stay in longer but remember we also mentioned depending on the kind of emotions you generated when you were in this physical world the similar vibration equivalent to that similar vibration you will land in that same subdivision in the astral world as well and so if there is more matter in the lower levels then you'll stay in the lower levels lo longer and then you will slowly start moving to the upper levels now, as you move to the upper levels, you will notice that the first one uh, is, is got to do more with people. Okay, let me go to the second and third before I go there. So if you look at the second subdivision that we're talking about in the astral world, they say that this is the place, the second subdivision is a shade less materialistic than the third one. And so if you call the latter the summer land of spiritualists, the former is the material heaven for the more ignorant uh, orthodox people. So most people get stuck in the third one, uh, which is definitely far better than the uh, lower four, but it's got to do more with the materialistic life. Yes. And so they call it the summer land of material heaven. And the summer land of spiritualists is basically the second level. And so they say the first or the highest level appears to those who are, yes, maybe partially materialistic, but also intellectuals. Yes, so if their interest lies more in the intellectual side of life, they get drawn towards the first, the first astral subdivision. Yes, and uh, these people who are talking about, when we say that they are actually materialistic, it doesn't necessarily, sorry, intellectual, it doesn't mean that they are going out there and preaching and doing stuff. No, it, it has nothing to do with intelligence that they are trying to gather for the sake of humanity. It has nothing to do with uh, being altruistic at this point. It could be even for selfish reasons, or maybe that they just like to 
study. They just like to read and gain more knowledge. So it could just be purely intellectual uh, with, uh, with or without any selfish motive. It doesn't matter. So when it's more intellectual, you lie at that level. However, remember the mental thought, uh, the mental uh, thought forms that we create will actually work better for us when we move into the mental world. Yes, right now we're still in the astral world. So moving in the astral world, you want to go to the three upper layers and stay there. Now, the interesting thing is, um, I think we mentioned this even earlier, but even in the astral world, people of similar liking gather and come together, right? And so there's an interesting example here, which I wanted to share with you. So it talks about, say, for example, there are religious, religious people who come together, right? And so when you find that you are people from a particular religion, and so then they actually, remember, this is a place where you can create anything you want, right? And so then they create this material heaven. And so the Christian create their own heaven based on what they've read or understood. The Hindus create their own heaven. The, the uh, people from the Islamic background create their own. The Jains create their own. The Buddhists create their own. And so um, if you don't belong to you know, most of those religions, but you, you're, say, for example, you're a Hindu or a Christian or whatever, then you are not drawn towards the the heaven built by the others, but towards the heaven <laughs> that is built based on your understanding of what heaven is supposed to look like, you know, with those angels and, um, and whatever else, the clouds and gates and whatever is, is understood, the, the apsaras or the devis or what is it called, the, the virgins, whatever it is you have understood <laughs> based on what heaven is, you see, the people there have all created it. And so you automatically get drawn towards that heaven, if you can call it, uh, with the kind of deities that uh, people actually worship. And you stay there. Now, this is misinterpreted as the heaven in some cases. And so I made that mistake also earlier. I remember when we were talking about it. So some people actually mistake this level, the first three levels of the astral world, to also be heaven. But this is not the heaven we are referring to in theosophy. Yes. Uh, so this is just the heaven that is represented by the emotions and thoughts that people gather through their scriptures or through the holy books that they have read. And therefore, people come together. Now, if you do not belong to any of this, but you are spiritualistic, then there's a gathering of those spiritual people also. And so you're basically trying to gather around you like minded people. Yes, uh, with similar thoughts and similar emotions, similar devotion, if you want to call it, similar love uh, towards uh, their God or, or their teacher. And so they all come together. So that's what we mean by in the astral world, this tends to happen regularly. Right. Uh, now, in the astral world, you are free to move through any world or any subdivision, but it really depends on the kind of matter you already have. Yes. Uh, so hopefully, if you have more subtle uh, astral matter or the emotions that you're creating in this physical world are more subtle, uh, then you will automatically be drawn into that level when you leave your physical body permanently and you move on with your journey. Now, you've also got to remember that this astral world that we're referring to, the physical world has a certain diameter, correct? The astral world is much bigger, just like our physical body is here, our etheric body is here, but the astral body is much bigger. Similarly, the astral world compared to our physical earth, it is much, much bigger. And so it is never crowded. <laughs> it doesn't feel like uh, the roads in Mumbai or the roads in Delhi or the traffic in Bangalore or whatever, uh, or, the, or, or the states uh, like the city in New York and things like that. Not, near, not during lockdown, but otherwise. It's not crowded. You don't feel like there are so many people. It would be like going to New Zealand and then you barely see people around, right? Or right now, when you look out on the road, it's not too many people, you know? There, there's not much traffic. There's not uh, a group or a herd of people walking around. So the astral world is much bigger. And so the space there, yes, for you to move is a lot more. Though it looks like the physical world, but the, the space is much more. And interestingly, in this space, um, we'll talk about it, who, who resides there. Now, another thing that I'd like to remind you is the average time in the astral world for an ordinary person is usually less than your own physical life. 
right? So it's mentioned here. I'm not sure which page it is for you, but it says here, the average life of humanity in the astral world is shorter than the average in the physical. Yes, so say for example, right now, average ages are about 70. You definitely won't be in the astral world for 70 years, right? Even that shopkeeper was only going there for 40 years. <laughs> yes, so the astral world should more or less be uh, shorter. And if you can continue your practices, like most of you are so determined to continue <laughs> both uh, all the five pillars, all the five virtues, if you can do this on a regular basis and you've purified yourself to a large degree, then your astral matter, when you move into your uh, astral body permanently, will be of higher subdivisions. Yes, and you will automatically be drawn to a similar uh, division on the other side. Yes. So um, let me look. I think I've got a picture there. All right. Uh, sorry, uh, Aditi, I'm going to ask you to again put there. Anjali there wants to know how she can uh, listen to the earlier uh, recordings. Some of them are still there. Many of them, the earlier few are not there. So let me just go to my share screen. All right. So, uh, oops, we went to the end. How did that happen? That's funny. Where did all my other PowerPoints go? <laughs> Hold on. Just give me a moment. I'm not too sure what happened. Oh, sorry, it just moved, that's why. Okay, nothing actually happened there. It was, it was, sorry, apologize. For some reason, it went to the last one because the, the PowerPoint had moved. Okay, so hopefully we are in, on track now. Okay, so in the astral world, we are not, uh, the permanent residents are not only those who have already left their physical body. Yes. So there are those who've left their physical body and have become permanent residents of the astral body. So they are there in this astral world, which is rather big. But one third of us who are sleeping, yes, when we go to bed at night are also living in the astral world. So approximately one third of the population is more or less there as well. Hopefully not many of them are daydreaming. Uh, so they're actually there at this point. And then you also have what is called the non-inhabitants of uh, the non-human inhabitants who we call the nature spirits who also reside in the astral world. Yes. And lastly, we also have angels. So in the astral world, you have, yes, the permanent residents who will not be coming back to the physical body. The other one third who are asleep in the physical body. So they will come back into their physical body at some point. And then there are these uh, nature spirits and then there are the angels as well. Yeah. So these are the other people that actually reside in the astral world. And so I'd like to go through that a little bit uh, if we have, we, I think we should have time, right? And so uh, the nature spirits, they form an enormous kingdom out there, yes? Now, this vast kingdom exists also in the physical world, but in the physical world, they have only what is called etheric bodies. Yes. And so Master Cho talks about them in his books as well, uh, especially in, in Psychic Self-Defense and other books. And so he says they are commonly spoken about as fairies. Uh, they are good people, pixies and or brownies. Now, these are the stories usually uh, narrated in, in the European tradition, in, uh, in the English tradition out there. Now, they're normally found in places where there are not too many people. So in lonely mountains, uh, you normally find them appearing there. They are visible to the naked eye, but not everybody is naked eye. So clairvoyants do see them. Uh, there are other peoples who see them. And so these beings exist. They coexist in the physical world, but do not have physical bodies, just etheric bodies. And... Uh, in, in all traditions, I mean, well, I'm sure if you look in deep into the Hindu tradition, you'll find that in the ancient Indian uh, tradition also, they did 
uh, recognize these beings. Uh, in the uh, Mayan tradition, in the old uh, Egyptian tradition, the, the, the existence definitely is there. Now, these uh, so-called nature spirits have not fully individualized. Yes, so in their evolution, we'll come to that in a bit, they have not yet evolved. And so um, almost all of them, yes, either are in their, in their etheric uh, bodies or in their astral bodies. So there are many in the physical world, but we were, we were talking about the astral world. So coming back to the astral world, they have astral uh, bodies also referred to as astral beings or astral animals. Now, in this case, you have to remember, just because they have etheric bodies or astral bodies doesn't mean that they are less evolved than us. Actually, many of them are intellectually as intelligent as a developed human being. Yes, and sometimes uh, we are talking about uh, not even a developed, an average human being. They are far more developed than an average human being. Yes, uh, so they are quite evolved as a race. Now, the categories uh, that they usually are uh, divided into is four, the nature spirits. Um, and this, uh, when you've done crystal healing, we have spoken about them. So the nature spirits of the air, yes, we know about them. Nature spirits of the earth, but here we have two more, water and fire. Yes, so the four elements, uh, if you heard Master Danny talk about yesterday, uh, it's, it's one of his favorite topics. So anyway, so the nature spirits are also four, all right? So you have the two that we're used to, earth and uh, air, and then you have two more, which is water and fire. So the nature spirits are connected to this. And uh, the mention of this is there in Master Chua's books. And so invoking to them when we, remember they are much more evolved. So asking them to help when you're working with your crystals actually makes a big difference, especially when you're programming them. And uh, so these, uh, so only the member of the last of these four divisions, which is basically air, normally confine their manifestation to the astral world, right? Uh, so you have some here, but um, many of them in the, uh, the air nature spirits try to stay more in the astral world than here. So only the last, which is the air of the four divisions, can find their manifestation to the astral world. Now, like I mentioned in, that, uh, in the um, PowerPoint that I just shared, the other, uh, the last category that we were looked at, looked at there is another great kingdom, uh, which is represented or the kingdom of uh, angels or in the Indian context also the kingdom of devas. So they also exist in the astral world. Interestingly, uh, when you look at it, uh, the evolution of man and the evolution of the angelic hierarchy actually do intertwine at some point, uh, but we'll come to that in, in, in a bit. So this is a body of beings who stand far higher in evolution than man. So when we talk about angels, they are nothing like us. It's not like the movies we've seen. It's not like any of them. They are far more evolved and very few uh, were in contact in the earlier days. We're talking about 100 odd years ago. Yes, and only the lowest in that category, uh, they, their hosts uh, touch the astral world. So even in that great range of angelic hierarchy, only the lowest rung, yes, more or less stay in the astral world and even less in the physical world. So, um, and these beings are also equally highly developed, just like the nature spirits that we were talking about before. Now, if you look at our solar system, we have to remember that you and I, the human race, are not the only race evolving at this point. Yes, we are the only beings with the physical body. However, there are other evolutions also occurring in the solar system. And so to remind us that just like we have levels to pass through, there are parallel evolutions happening. So if this is the human kingdom and we're going up all the way, there's a parallel evolution happening. We are not going to coincide at this point. However, uh, we will all pass through similar levels. Yes, we might call it different. They might call it different. But we all have levels of evolution, parallel evolution happening. Uh, one of those orders or line of evolution is that of the nature spirits and the angelic hierarchy. Yes. So just for you to remember. Now, at a certain point, as you go higher, they will actually meet. Yes. And then there, there can be a, a change or, or an exchange sometimes. Now, um, just for our understanding. 
where is that? Uh, I wanted to talk to you about the seventh ray. Yes. So uh, they, they're talking about in this book that this is about 100 years ago. They're saying that the seventh ray, remember there are seven rays as well. And at that point, they were saying that the seventh ray, the influence of the seventh ray, once it starts, because the seventh ray is also associated with ceremony, ceremonial magic. Remember that? So as that starts happening and along with the, with the tradition, for example, of the Christian tradition, the connection with the uh, angelic hierarchy and the nature spirits might increase. Yes. So this, basically the angelic kingdom will increase. That's all they have mentioned here. Anyway, so coming back, when all of, we're coming back again to the astral body. So when the person who has moved out of his physical body permanently into the astral body has been able to now take care of allowing all his low emotions to kind of wither away and wear away from him, yes, he can start moving upwards. And so they say his life in the astral world slowly is over. He's done everything that he can in the astral world. His, his lower emotions are gone. He's gone to the higher levels. He's reached as far as he can. And then it's time for him to let go now of his astral body. And so then he will move now. It says here, the ego passes on into the mental world. And so once you've worn out everything, you finish with everything that you have to do, it's time for you now to move on to the mental world. Now, the mental world is a very different world from what you and I have been talking about. You see, at least the astral world, we've been familiar with. Every night we sleep and we've been getting into this astral body and traveling. Whether we can remember it all or not, we have definitely been doing it regularly. So it's, it's one of those bodies you're, you're used to, uh, you're aware of. However, interestingly, <laughs> the mental body you're not familiar with. It's a body that you haven't used before. And therefore, it is definitely a very, very rare body for all of us. And so to move on. So we're talking about the astral body. And now, very quickly, the astral body. Uh, oh, sorry. There's one more part over there. Sorry, before I go there. So we're going to move now slowly into the mental body. Interestingly, when you and I leave the astral body, the, if I can call it the energy of the higher soul, has withdrawn from the astral body. However, the body that you have will not disintegrate straight away. Yes? And so in some cases, part of you still lies in that, what you call astral body which is now referred to as a shade. Now, the process will go on to disintegrate completely, but before it does, it takes some time. You as a higher soul have already pulled out of your astral body. You've gone into the mental body. But in the meantime, there is part of it, part of you that still lies there till it completely disintegrates. It doesn't completely disintegrate straight away, unlike our physical body. So when we leave our physical body, we leave our physical body 100%. Yes. And this body is then burnt or uh, buried or whatever they, they, they tend to do with it. It doesn't matter. But the thing is, we have disconnected from this physical body fully, more or less. Whereas in the astral body, we have moved out. But then this, that astral body doesn't get disintegrated as quickly. And so what happens? There are a couple of conditions that I like to just show you, uh, share with you. So the prop, the, uh, the, for the purpose of understanding this, when man leaves his physical body, he is separated, as I said. Now, in the astral body, part of who he is still is there. Yes? And so that astral body, as it stays there, if, say, a member of your family comes into the astral body during their sleep time and sees this body, they might actually think it's you because it looks like you, it has characteristics of you, and it behaves like you. And so family members might actually think you are still in the astral world, though you might have actually moved into your mental world, into your mental body and into the mental world. Now, when you have seances that they talk about, the, the entity that they call upon is usually this. And so it has characteristics of you. It has part of the energy as well. And so it tends to remain Yes, and people then feel that they're communicating actually uh, in many cases with their family members, which is not completely true. And so it says, uh, this means that he identifies them so closely uh, with his lower desire and, sorry, sorry, not this part. Uh, 
And so in the end, uh, this continues till the entire astral body disintegrates. And it says, uh, consecu uh, cons consequently, sorry, when he finally breaks away from the astral body, 100%, and transfers his activities to the mental, he loses a little of himself, which he had left before in the astral body. A little of himself is left behind in prison in the matter of the astral body. Yes. And this might, this thing might stay on for a little while. And so this fragment, this fragmented entity that lives, uh, we give the name shade. Yes. But in due course, it will completely actually disintegrate. Now, uh, continuing with the stage of fragment, there's not just one, there's another one as well. So let me go to that as well. And so, like I said, the ego usually passes on to the, uh, or ego is higher soul, passes on to the mental world. And this body is not entirely disintegrated. So the first one that we spoke about was the shade. Yes, the shade is where part of you is still lying in that body with your characteristics and your way. Now, then slowly everything is withdrawn. However, in a later stage, this fragment of consciousness, the consciousness of you within that uh, astral body will die completely out of the astral body and, and does not return uh, to the ego or to the higher soul like always. It just disintegrates and goes away. It completely loses consciousness. Interestingly, uh, when it is quite empty now, the astral body has no, nothing of yours left to a large ex extent. What is left then is called a shell, right? So when your consciousness is completely gone out of the astral body, there's no longer a shade. Yes, nothing is there. There's, there's just like a shell left. Now the shell can then be used by these naughty nature spirits. Yes, so what do they do? Such shells are frequently seized. <laughs> You know, it feels like you, you see the car, but anyway, uh, by these nature spirits, nature spirits who use them temporarily. Now they use it to, to cause havoc in the physical world or in the family uh, that this person comes around. So they, they come to seances and they masquerade as that person because certain characteristics are still there. Remember the consciousness is gone, but you more or less look the same. And, and, and so they start <laughs> using this body moving around and pretending to be this person with the characteristics and uh, portions of his memory that is still there in the emotional body. They start using it and moving around with this astral corpse, uh, sorry, uh, the corpse, uh, if you can call it that. Yes. And uh, so this is something that I wanted to mention at this point. And one little point before we go into the mental body. So is this clear about the shade and the shell? Shell has nothing of you. The shade has a little bit of you, but that's about it. Now, there are still others. Uh, we sleep, yes, we go into the astral body, but when we permanently leave the physical body and move into the astral body, they are so scared of moving into the astral body completely. They leave the physical body, yes, because there's no, no way out. Uh, so there's a physical body here and there's the astral body here and they're supposed to go, but they're so stuck with their physical life. You know, there is still the etheric body around this. They latch onto that. And so instead of moving into the, the astral world or into the astral body and with the body that they've left, they're literally right in between. And they get so stuck with the etheric body. They stay or, or, or stay in that body for a while. And they then get surrounded by this dark mist. Yes, and they can see through it, but they prefer to stay in this etheric body, which they are more familiar with rather than actually moving into the astral world. And so they cling on to their etheric body. So this is the third aspect that I just wanted to mention with reference to the between part about the astral and the mental body. Now, some men succeed in shaking themselves free of the etheric envelope in a few moments usually after we leave the body. Uh, the rest usually take about few hours, maybe maximum few weeks, yes, to, to let go of this etheric body. But there are still others who cannot let go of it. And they get stuck in that for a while, yeah? So just to give you an understanding of that. 
there are some men who cling so desperately to their physical vehicles that they will not relax their hold upon the etheric double, but strive with all their might to retain it. Yes, and uh, sadly, they are then surrounded by a gray mist at this point. They drift about in the condition of loneliness and misery until because of sheer fatigue, yes, just tired of, you know, just groping around all over in this, in this body and this gray mist, that body ultimately falls off. Yes, and uh, they slip into a comparatively, in their case, I'm sure uh, the state of the astral world is far happier than their gray, gloomy astral body that they were lugging around for a while. Yeah, so in invariably even they will come into the astral world, but it's just that they delayed it. Instead of a couple of hours or days, maximum few weeks, these guys have been hanging on to it for a longer time. Yeah, but they will ultimately come into the astral world. Anyway, at the astral uh, world, we're letting it off. Some people might still have a shade and some people might uh, still have part of their astral body remaining and used as a shell by others, which again will ultimately uh, disintegrate. Right? And... Uh, Yes, so hopefully they also mention in this book, if you can understand the concept of life and death, just this understanding alone will hopefully help you trans, you know, uh, have a smooth transition from your physical body into your astral body and then maybe from your astral body into your mental body. Yes, just the knowledge will come to you and hopefully that will help you as you uh, move around. All right, and then, sorry, I'm just looking at these messages. Maha. Okay, um, Aditya will try and put the details of where you can find the previous recordings, yeah? Aditya, okay, Pavan Shah has already put that up here in the chat group, please. So uh, that, that would definitely help you. Okay, so moving on. Where did I stop? Those with. Have I moved into the astral world, mental world? Where am I? Hold on. Just a little stuck suddenly. Okay. So coming now, now based on uh, this transition that you are going through, ultimately you and I will now then move from the astral body into the mental body. Now, like I said, the mental body is a body that you and I are not familiar with. It's, it's a very different body. But if your thoughts in this mental body, remember now in the mental body, you have no emotions. Anything got to do with emotions of another person or whatever it is, anything that, that is selfish or um, anything that is negative in any uh, form with emotions have all been worn out, disintegrated, worked through, purified before you come into the mental body. So when you come into the mental body, only your thoughts that are um, basically for love for someone, yes, not because it is selfish, but purely because you feel love for someone, uh, the devotion to a teacher, um, the love that you want to manifest for humanity, the ability to take care of a group of people, all these thoughts that you have, all these plans that you have, all this that you have created during your physical life, will now come into the mental world. But interestingly, when it comes into the mental world, there's a lot more that happens there in the mental world than otherwise. Yeah. So in the mental world, if you look at it, you can either have, I mean, this is what you actually call heaven. All right. So the mental world is basically what you call heaven life. The one that we spoke about in the astral world is basically what we were calling it earlier as purgatory or purging or purifying. So this is actually heaven life and anything that you have done for another person without any selfish motive, purely out of love. Yes. Any kind of altruistic action taken by you will come with you into this astral body. Yes. And they say that this is undescribable bliss in this part of the world. If you think, you know, sometimes in your, in your meditation, you're so blissed out. Imagine this being hundred times more. So everything that is experiential, which has got nothing to do with you, the I or the solar plexus center, this is amazing. And uh, it, they actually say this is 
utter joy of living. That sounds more like tasting. I think Sriram will like that image. So it's basically got to do with enjoying life to the fullest. Because we sometimes think what we are having here is an amazing life, but out there, it's truly amazing. And uh, you can learn so much more. Yes. And so I'm going to share a few things from here uh, to help you understand this a little bit more. Yeah. Let me give you. So the heaven life in the mental world is out of all proportion more bliss, blissful than even the astral world. Because even in the astral world, we did say you would be blissful. But this one, the proportion is nothing compared to even astral bliss. It's, it's much, much more. Now, just as the bliss can increase in your life, even the wisdom, yes, your ability to gain more knowledge, more wisdom, enhances multifold in length and breadth. Yes. And so there's a lot more that you can actually enjoy. And so they say in the physical world and in the astral world, if you think you were understanding or you were learning something, yes, uh, you were gaining knowledge. He says that can only be compared to a caterpillar that is, you know, crawling and, and gaining all this knowledge. But he says, when you come into the mental world, it's like you've suddenly been given a pair of wings and like a butterfly, you can see the whole world. And the interesting thing about this is, one second. The interesting thing about this is, if you can see the third point there, you can access the infinite fullness of the divine mind, right? And so what do you want? The, the world there opens out and it's so much wider with so much more knowledge that you have given or gained, right? And so man's position in the, Mental world differs wide, wildly from that of the astral world. Nothing in comparison to that. Now, one of the things is any of your refined emotion gets enhanced here. Yes. And, uh, <clears throat> and that is something that would really help you as you go forward. And so I'd like to share what is written here uh, with reference to your emotions. Refined thoughts, the noble and unselfish aspiration which he poured out during earth life, this surrounds him like a sort of a shell. Yes, and those are the thoughts that will help you live through this mental world. Now, interestingly, in the mental world, unlike the astral world where you start from the lowest level of subdivision and going upwards, there is no such movement. Yes, so if you if you have had thoughts of a certain level, you will come only to that level, right? And you will stay in that level. You will gain anything and everything that you can based on your thoughts. You will learn more. You will understand more. You will experience more. And then you will go into the causal level. Yes. And remember the, the mental body is only the lower mental part of that, that layer, those subdivisions. And so he says, um, I want to read you this thought about this person and the friend. Wait one minute. Let me get that. Thank you. All right, let me just add this here. Uh, when we were talking about the divine mind, right? Now, I said you cannot go into any and all levels, right? Any subdivision. So they say a man who has already completed his human evolution, which means you do not have to come back again. The man who has fully realized and unfolded the divinity within him, yes, finds this mental world. Yes, the, the, he finds the whole of his glory within reach. Yes, and if you can meet such a man and, or such a soul, and if he could tell you what they could, um, they could gain in that mental world is something that none of them can write because they say, we haven't reached that level. We haven't reached the level of complete soul uh, union, uh, soul realization, un union with a higher soul to go further up. But if we have done that this lifetime, yes, we've, we've had complete union with our higher soul. We're really pure and clean. And then when we go into the mental world, the glory and the, the experience and the bliss that you will find there is something unimaginable. And they say, if you can meet someone like that, you would have a, a lot more to learn. But I'm wondering if our brain can understand what they're going to talk to us about. So um, I want to give you this. 
there's a story about a friend. I, I, I wanted to share that. I didn't want to use my words. Okay, somewhere here. So say for example, you have this um, amazing friend, yes? And you have this amazing connection. However, you have left the world and you have moved forward and you've actually reached the mental world and your friend is still in the physical world. They say, uh, because the fragment of thought that you have created of that friend, the friend, uh, even though the friend is still in the physical body, when you have, when you have those amazing thoughts about them, those thoughts literally go towards the friend in the physical world. And because you see that friend of yours, not just as a physical body with those amazing qualities, but your, your love for him is not on the physical level, but actually your love for that friend is on the mental level, which is closest to who he really is. Yes, closest to his higher soul. So when you are in your mental body and you send a response of love towards your friend, the response from your friend, even though he's still in the physical body, doesn't come from the physical body, but from the mental body. And so because you are then reaching out to him as he truly or closest to how he truly is. Right? And so when you're in the mental body, if you do have love and devotion, or say, for example, you're someone who loves Grandma Sachua and you've already reached that level. When you think of the teacher, it's beyond the master that you knew in the physical body. Beyond any guru that you knew in the physical body, you connect to the true, the truest or the closest to the truest form of your real guru. And so can you imagine the response you would get at that level? You've got to remember by then already you are quite pure. In the astral world, you have shed most of your impurities you hopefully have not taken too long there. And you have now come into the mental body where you will stay for a long time, longer than, uh, than the others, I think. And, and then you move on. So th there is this part about this, the, the, the aspect of the friend. If you can find that and read it, it's really nice. I mean, I found it interesting to, to look at that. So uh, in case a person has true devotion, right? Uh, like I was talking about maybe to a deity or to a guru or to a master or teacher, the man in the heaven world is two great stages nearer to the object of his, of his true devotion than he was in the physical life. So his experience are far more transcendent in character than when you were in the physical world. Yes. So if you felt love and devotion to this teacher or your guru or to God, when you're at that point, again, experiencing love or devotion, it changes completely. And they say it's, it's, it's character uh, transcends anything else that you know. Okay, and then I want to give you a little bit more information before we leave. Okay, so um, just to give you a few uh, understanding of those those sections there since it's the lowest section so you've got to remember the seventh sixth fifth right we're going to look at those uh, here right now so the lowest portion is unselfish usually connected with unselfish family affection right so when you loved your parents or you loved your siblings or your spouse or your children or your grandchildren so when you come into the mental world with pure affection for all these people, you stay at the lowest of the mental world, right? Remember I said you can't move to others. Yes, there's no way you can move from uh, seven to six to five. You, you can't do that. So just to understand, so if your affection is purely towards your family, and hopefully most people do have some love for some family member of them. Yes, if not, hopefully their mother or someone. And so when you have this unselfish love, then or affection, then you stay at the lowest or the seventh subdivision of the mental body. Yes. Okay. I'm glad you came for the Bangalore retreat, sir. <laughs> I can see your screen. <laughs> can you please stop sharing? And then we have the next one. Oops, my page moved with that. 
Oopsie, where did I go? Yes. Then the sixth, the sixth level may be said to be with reference to anthro, anthropophoric religious devotion. My God. Anyway, so basically with your religion, if you've been truly religious and devoted to God and the deities and the great being and the great uh, supreme being, then if your love and devotion was at that level, then you will stay at the sixth subdivision of the mental body. And then going on further, while the fifth one, yes, the highest at this point, is devotion expressed itself in active work of some sort. And normally it is for outside of you, obviously. And so all these, the fifth, sixth and seventh subdivision are concerned with working out of devotion to family, uh, to your uh, religion, yes, uh, to certain people rather than um, devotion purely to humanity. Yes. And so they move then to the next section. The activities of this fourth stage are varied. Yes, and so we're coming to the last stage of this mental world. There are only four. We spoke about three. And so the last stage is further divided into four main uh, sections. The four main divisions are, yes, uh, you may make note of it. I, I did not have time to type this out. So the main four divisions are, I'm not sure which page it is. Does anybody know which page I'm on? Can you type it there? So the four divisions, 119, perfect. So those of you who have a book, you can go to page 119 and you may mark it or highlight it for yourself. Unselfish pursuit of spiritual knowledge. Yes, so unselfish pursuit of uh, spiritual knowledge. And this is not because you, know, you, you are doing it because you want to um, tell people how intelligent you are or you're going to give talks and make people think this. When it is selfish, it cannot be here. Remember, anything selfish will not come into the mental world. So it has to be unselfish. So unselfish pursuit of spiritual knowledge, high philosophy or scientific thought. Yes. Uh, so this could be even people in uh, who you and I would call uh, scientific uh, researchers, scientists. They could all be, if their thought is pure, nothing to do with gaining popularity or you know winning the Nobel Prize or whatever, but purely to make, uh, the knowledge known and to help improve mankind, then these people would come under that category and into the fourth realm or the fourth subdivision. The next is literacy or artistic ability exercised at this point for unselfish purposes. So when people make these huge monuments, uh, not because they want again recognition, but purely just to manifest that artistic ability out there uh, for others, uh, it, it is another way in which they will reach this area. And then uh, services for the sake of service. That's it. Now, do you understand why Master Chua has constantly been telling us do service? Meditation is not enough. Making that heart big and your crown big is not enough. We have to use that energy in the crown to go and do good out there. Manifest in the form of service. Love and action is service. And so the highest level that you can reach in the mental world, if you do service for others with no expectations, you will reach there. And you will enjoy whatever you get at that point, which obviously cannot be expressed in these words and in the book. Right? So remember, uh, Master Cho just tells us to do three hours in a week. Right. And so if you can do more to help others, it would really make a big difference in your presence when you do work towards your mental uh, body and in the mental world. Yes. So lastly, just to repeat myself, unselfish pursuit of spiritual knowledge is one. The next is with uh, philosophy or science. The third is literacy or sorry, lit, uh, uh, literary and artistic ability. And the last one is with reference to service, purely for service. So if you're not an artist, you're not a scientist, you're not a philosopher, <laughs> don't worry, just do the last one. Yes, everyone can do service to help others, right? And so I presume that's why uh, when you look at, you know, great teachers and great uh, 
saints uh, who we call um, arhats who have already gone ahead of us or paramahansas who have gone ahead of us. The, the quality of service is amazing. Yes, without that quality of service, it's, it's not possible for them to go that high. And one of the reasons here, yes. And so with that, once you've reached this level and you, you've gained whatever you want, then it's time for you to shed this shield or this body and then move on to the last and come back to where we all came from. Yes. So it's time for you to now shed the last body and move into your causal body, which is referred to as your true home. Right. However, in the human race, they say that a majority of us are not completely conscious of this particular state, right? And so it's men mentioned here, majority of men have as yet but very little consciousness as such uh, at, this, at this particular point, and they rest dreamingly, unobservant and scarcely awake. Right, they're not even aware. And then if they do wake, they do get a glimpse of what is around and, and then they go back to sleep. Yep. And so you do not want to hopefully stay in this state. However, as you start to evolve more and more and more, so every time you come back to your home, the causal body, your ability to stay awake, the ability to stay in the, in the causal world, sorry, for a longer period of time also starts to increase. Right? And so... Our goal is the last one where you want to increase your lifespan in the causal body compared to the lower levels of existence, whether it's the physical, the emotional or the mental worlds. You want to see to it that life ultimately in the causal world is increased. And that happens as we, you and I, start to overcome our limitations, our weaknesses, purify further and further and work towards more altruistic action and service to others. Yes. So it says here, as you start to improve, right? As you start to improve continuously, the causal life grows longer and longer, assuming an ever larger proportion as compared to the existent at the lower levels. And that's what I emphasize in the last line, right? So when you move towards more of the teachings of uh, Lord Maitreya, Lord Christ, Lord Krishna, it says, when you start to learn the lessons of these great teachers, learning the crowning glo glory of sacrifice, the supreme delight of pouring out all his life for the helping of his fellow men, the devotion of the self, of celestial strength to human service, of all those splendid heavenly forces to aid of the struggle the struggling sons of earth. So when you start to work towards service is basically what they're talking about. You have something waiting for you up there, right? And so, and so if you are somewhere there, then if you are up, it says here the golden ladder that you are climbing, then you can tell your brothers down there, you know, there's so much more up here. You should climb and come up so we can all go up there and enjoy our, cause a life, go through heaven, stay in heaven for some time, and then ultimately go home to our higher soul. Yes. And so with that, we come to the end. Yeah, I managed <laughs> the end of our chapter. And uh, tomorrow we'll come to chapter seven, which is reincarnation. Interesting topic. So if you can brush through and read through uh, the others, if you haven't, or listen to the topics, uh, the, the talk is long. But if you would like to, you can go back to the earlier talks and look at it. <laughs> yes. Uh, unselfish pursuit of uh, knowledge is basically where you are trying to learn, to gather knowledge. Yes, not because you want to be known as someone who has a lot of intelligence, not to, in, uh, to evoke the pride in you, intellectual pride but purely because you want to learn to understand and use that understanding to help others. Yes, not for any personal gain. As long as you do that without any, uns any, any kind of selfish tinge attached to it, then you are already working towards that. Yep. So that is the meaning of uh, what we spoke about. Service for service. Can you please clarify what you actually mean? What I mean is... Uh, 
when you know they say that even when you take care of your family yes whether you're a mother or a father um, whether you have children or grandchildren when you take care of that them it's through love and that love that you feel for them is is purely because of service right so that love when it manifests it is called service so love in action is called service so when you take care of your child it's actually service now your service cannot be limited only to your family you can't only say okay fine my brothers my sisters you know this is all i'm going to do service this is all whom i'm going to do service for your service should go beyond family should go beyond friends even to people you've never met right now say in 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 the time of uh, this global pandemic how are you actually helping bless others who you do not know maybe through the twin hearts meditation maybe through the great invocation yes maybe you're doing thai thing to help anybody i mean the migrant laborers in your area maybe the people the slum dwellers who haven't got food for a while how are you then providing for your fellow brothers and sisters globally or in your city or in your state without expecting anything in return yes so when you do the act of love unselfishly without expecting anything in return that is when you're doing service when you get paid then you've been paid for your service the karma changes right but when you do service purely because you want to do this to help someone else out there then there is a big difference in your act of love right parents normally don't expect children to do certain things for them but children out of love and respect for their parents should do certain things to take care of them or should do certain things for them right but it is written it makes sense for us to take care of our elders not just with in family but wherever whoever they are so service is when you do manifest love in action unselfishly without any expectations without wanting you know what i help you that time you should help me now <laughs> then that's not service yeah so to try and work on that is is important as we evolve don't push yourself it should must also say service should come from your heart naturally automatically right uh, the reason for me i i've seen master chor do this and whether it was healing someone uh, whether it was giving a talk you know um just like we do sometimes with the acharyas or sometimes uh, other people we say oh you're coming for a class can you do this 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 for us <laughs> and so when master chaur came they say oh, master you're doing this course and we're doing this can you do a session in the evening can you do a session the day you come and um i remember there was this one time we had a retreat uh, it was in bangalore and it was at the angsana retreat and for the first time we did what was called a seven day <laughs> yes a seven day residential retreat with masacho that was the only one time we've ever done it in india a seven day full uh, retreat and so we decided you know everyone should have a good time so it was uh, i think it was 3 days of prep retreat um so we had 3 days prep retreat then we had level 1 level 2 uh level 3 and then 4 and 5 <laughs> seven days and at the end of it he called us and he you know we said master thank you for it. he says you know you made your guru really work hard <laughs> i was like oh i didn't mean to master <laughs> i wasn't my i just thought it would be the best way you know for everyone to experience and enjoy a full day of master chow with a level but yes uh master chow would would still do those things and and i realized um one of the things i would tell even his his children when i would meet them is that your your dad spends so much of time with all of us and um it would be right only now for us to then take care of you because you've had such little time with your dad compared to the amount of time we've had you know uh we were lucky enough to travel with him and so because we traveled with him we spend day and night because <laughs> we have meetings in the night with masachu and uh, we were learning from him we were understanding things and how to do things with people with organizations and uh he would only go back home for i think the only time he took a break with his family was christmas and new years and so that was the only time we know master chow is not going to call us <laughs> there's not going to be any phone calls saying uh chela good morning how are you but he would he would take that time but we've had a lot of the guru the books that he's written is is truly amazing if he hadn't written those books and it was only talks he says you see i can i can do i can go around and travel 
and do the work uh, because this is my purpose. And he says, uh, if I just stay back and just heal, I could earn a lot more. And he says, I'm writing the books because the books will outlive my courses. Because he can live only for so many years and he can teach only so many people in a class. But his books can reach out to a lot more. You know, the number of people that we can reach out. I mean, if you just remember the last week when we did our uh, Arhatic session, we had about 4,000 people every day, literally. Not, not every day, 3.8. So, but to have so many people come together and meditate together, I mean, Master has done so much work, so much service to see to it that even after he's left, after 12 years, the school still continues and it's just increasing more and more and more and more. Yes, and so for me, that is service. And when he did these sessions, he never took money. Even for the retreats he came, whatever, he never took any money back. That for me was amazing. He says, I have enough money, I don't need it. But the point is, that's service for me, right? It doesn't mean that uh, you shouldn't, but uh, for me, I'd like to just follow what I've seen Master Cho do. Yes, but for some people, money is important. They need to survive. So let me go on. Okay, um, <laughs> visiting causal body only possible after death? Yes, uh, to a large extent, yes. But in your meditation, if you have really, really deep meditations and you've purified yourself, you might have a glimpse of your higher soul. And sometimes when you go there, you do not want to come back home. And that's what people say. It felt like I reached home and I did not want to come. But you will have to come back because you haven't finished your responsibilities work and home and family responsibility. So you will have to come back, right? Uh, yes, service here, here would include um, to family, to friends, yes, but you will have to slowly move out of that. Now you can't be doing service out there and not doing any service at home. <laughs> that doesn't work as well. You have to take care of your family, friends, and then also move out. Yeah, uh, will everyone move to causal body? even though they, uh, they have to take another... Yes, um, you, will, you will notice that in the chapter tomorrow that we do. We will all go home. Only when we go back home to the causal body can you come back down. You can't take a U-turn anywhere else. Yeah, you have to go all the way up there and only then come back. No way to do that before. When does the shedding of astral body and mental body will, will it happen? Uh, well, um, for this, you'll have to look at the earlier section, but just to give it very quickly, uh, the shedding of the astral body <clears throat> is when you've worked through all your lower emotions and you've enjoyed your uh, higher emotions, depending on which level, <clears throat> uh, which level of astral matter you've been able to create in the physical world. Once you finish with all of that, then you move higher up into the mental world. And again, you will stay in the mental world, whether it's got to do with, uh, with, with devotion and love to your family or to your religion. Yes. And so based on that, you will stay on any of those four levels and then only will you move up. Yeah. Um, let me see if I can answer this a little later. Angel and uh, nature spirits. There, there is a slight distinction between them. So the nature spirits are the ones that are connected and associated with the physical world. Right. And so they are basically etheric in nature and partially astral. Whereas the angelic hierarchy the lowest rung is partially in the astral world and the rest are up. Yes, uh, so they are slightly different. If, if I can, I'll explain it later. Um, what happens to the astral body once you go to the higher plane? Like we said, it can remain as a shade for some time and then move into a shell and then completely disintegrate, yeah? Selfless service, but then we also decrease. So shouldn't we decrease? Um, I'm not too sure about the decree. The only time Master Choa has told us to decree is when we tithe, right? So tithing is money. So when you give money as a part of what you want to do to generate good karma, prosperity karma, and to open up your heart, for that you decree. But when I do service, yeah, say for example, uh, I've decided to go and do an intro talk of pranic healing somewhere, uh, that is purely out of service. I am not going to get paid for that. I'd love to do it because then Hopefully that will help um, the organization and generate more, um, generate more students for the foundation. That's it. 
I, I don't decree. I don't say, okay, fine. Because I did that intro talk, may it come back to me. So I personally have never decreed. Um, I've never known Master Cho to mention that. But if you have heard it from someone, you need to ask them where the source is, right? Because sometimes people just make their own uh, teachings. So <laughs> you need to check and see where they actually got these teachings from. So as far as I know, there is no decree. Other than for blessing earth, could you please elaborate the uh, application of GI? Uh, well, you need to try and tr get a blessed poster if you can from your local foundation. You place the Great Invocation poster east, yeah, on the east wall. And uh, this is for Master Cho says for spirituality. So if you want to increase spiritual energy in your house or in your space, you may put it on, on the east wall. And if you want it, uh, if you want more prosperity, then you place it on the north wall. Yeah. So for me, this is north and that is east. And so that's where my Great Invocation poster is. Now, when you say this, you have to start with an invocation, three ohms. Then you say the great invocation three times, and then you end with three ohms. Now, why do we do that? Because Master Chua says, with the blessings, uh, with Master Chua and the host of uh, higher beings, he said, when they bless the poster. At the center of the poster, where you find there is that, like a reddish pearl, and there's like white coming out of it, that's actually a point of light. So every time you say the great invocation, that point of light, Master Chua says, starts to grow and grow and grow. And so if we say it regularly, and so if I'm looking at this poster and saying it regularly, there would be a huge light around here. Uh, we've been saying it from March 22nd every day, right? And say, for example, uh, three, four lanes away, there's another person who has a great invocation and she's also, he's also saying it. Then Master Cho says, if there are more and more, more and more points of light that grow, then it can transform that space. So the uh, Great Invocation poster is truly amazing. And if you can continue to say it every day, at least just every day, maybe it takes a minute and a half only. Um, three ohms, three Great Invocation, three ohms would really, really be beneficial for you. And get a blessed poster because the point of light is there, right? And uh, if, say for example, I'm from the city of Bangalore right now. And if there are even a hundred people here uh, who are now seeing the Great Invocation every day looking at their poster, they have already generated points of light throughout the city. Yes, and that is meant for, um, right now we're using it for the COVID-19, but you can also invoke uh, and you can place your hand, your receiving hand, allow the energy from the Great Invocation to come here and then use the other hand. It can be a source of lovely healing energy as well. Yeah, you can also say this if you would like, if you're in a business space, uh, to generate more energy in the in this uh, in the business space, but then you have to place it on the north wall, yeah, not on the east wall. I hope that helps you. And uh, so, explain following life, and yet beyond all these, there is still another life, that of the intuitional world, into which <laughs> even this is but as moonlight. Uh, unto sunlight. Yes, that's the last line, uh, last few lines before we end that chapter. So basically they're saying, though I'm talking about all this and we, I've made you uh, aware that the mental world is so blissful, so amazing, and there's so much wisdom. Uh, we're still talking about uh, only till that mental, higher mental plane, which is the causal that we reached uh, right now. But there are worlds above that. Yes. And so uh, if you if you uh, look through the earlier um, talks, then there is something called the intuitional world, and so when you work go into the intuitional world, then your experience there is completely different, right? When you unite completely with your higher soul in the causal body, you don't you don't have to come back uh, to take on the respective bodies we were talking all this while, physical, emotional, and mental. You just need to move on higher upwards, and that is called towards God realization. And so one of the worlds that you will go through is the intuitional world. However, when you do the twin hearts on a regular basis, the crown chakra of ours, because we are associated, the crown chakra is associated with intuition, is connected directly to the intuitional world, right? So there, there is that con connection and through that, uh, your intuition gets enhanced. And so they're trying to tell you when you go into that world, what I'm talking about right now is nothing. Yes, uh, it's like, the moonlight, which is actually the reflection of the sun. By itself, the moon isn't great. Yes, if there's no light on the moon, we won't even notice it. And so when you go into the intuitional world, what you, will, you and I will experience is going to be truly amazing, truly remarkable. 
Okay, uh, in the Hindu tradition, when a person leaves the physical body, the family members normally don't celebrate uh, festivals for one year. What is the meaning behind? I think uh, this is customary in most um, religions from what I know. Uh, they kind of just kind of uh, reduce everything that that is called uh, with reference to celebration. Um, now, do we have to actually do that and continue to do that? I'm not too sure. If you've read the book Solar System by Arthur Powell, he actually says you need to celebrate. Uh, it shouldn't be a point. And, and in certain parts of the world, they still celebrate. I think certain parts of Africa and other places, when someone actually leaves the body, uh, they actually celebrate because they realize a person has gone beyond uh, and all that we've lost is only their physical body, but they are still around. And so it's actually a celebration, not a, a point of mourning. Uh, but I think at this point, all religions seem to follow something similar where they feel they need to respect the, the person who's gone uh, forward and not have celebrations or weddings or, you know, like a, 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 a naming ceremony and anything that is considered a, a big event should, should actually be uh, toned down to a large, large extent, even if it has to go through. But, you know, for the, uh, like, we, like we heard in the ASVA's class, I think, or day before, for the dead, you and I are still living and alive. They don't feel they're dead. <laughs> they know they're continuing with life. Right. So they, they're right here right now. So stopping with that right now, does it make sense? Based on what I've read, maybe not. But for that, the whole of the human race has to get educated to realize you don't have to mourn someone's death and, and reduce on all celebrations because they would have preferred for you to enjoy uh, your life and, and the wedding or the naming ceremony of a, of a newborn in the family rather than actually reduce on all of it. Yeah. But this is, this is a tradition, whether it's the Chinese people that I know, or whether it is the Indian people that I know, uh, religions across, all of them seem to more or less follow this. So that's, that's still the old ways and new ways will come about. All right. Okay, so the question here is why are the teachings of Grand Master Chua uh, so private and expensive? One of the things that Master Chua said, with reference to pranic healing, all the books of pranic healing were and uh, can be available to the public, not a problem, but also available in book bookstores. Uh, the teachings that he keeps secret is Arhatic Yoga. And so he says Arhatic Yoga is not for everybody. Yes, it's, uh, these teachings are uh, priceless and precious. And there are many, he says, you know, Thousands will come to do the class. A hundred will be inspired to do it. Out of a hundred, only 10 will continue to practice it. Right? So even if you're inspired and amazed by these great teachings of the, of the guru, uh, they still take it for granted. And uh, when, when you pay for it, you're not actually paying. Because remember, Master Chua doesn't really get the money. Uh, what, what he says is, even in the old days, uh, regardless of which religious or spiritual tradition you come from, when you want to learn from the teacher, you have to provide hours and hours and hours and hours of work. Yes. So you might stay with the guru for a year, two years, three years before he or she will actually give you certain teachings, which you are then entitled to receive. But Master Chua says, since most of you are living in towns and cities and have family and work responsibilities, it's not possible for you to come and stay with me in the ashram or somewhere to then Purify and work on yourselves enough to then pay for um, pay for the teachings that you will learn. And so he says, you are now then given an opportunity to pay, say, this amount. All right, say it's uh, it's a two hundred dollars or five hundred dollars or um, seven thousand Indian rupees or whatever. So when you pay this money, it is like um, in the, in the Indian context, we actually call it the Guru Dakshina. Yes. So you have to provide in order to receive. And since we do not have that kind of time today, I don't think any of us have the luxury of leaving our house and work and going to an ashram or going up to the Himalayas and saying, okay, I'm gonna be there for uh, two years and three years to learn and come back. We don't have that luxury. And so one of the easiest way he says, we can give you this is when you pay for it. However, remember the money that we pay for these prices teaching is nothing compared to what we actually earn. Right. And so whether it's, it's a 5,000 or even a 10,000 Indian rupees, it's nothing compared to what we actually gain. And uh, 
that is one of the reasons because if you get teachings freely master Cho says you can be sure that that person is not going to value it and this has happened personally even with uh, organizations here in in uh, in india where because of the numbers that we have sometimes we say okay fine let's just give it freely to you know five ten people and those people come for a class and then you never see them and this has happened all through india right i'm sure it's happening even in other places but uh, this is definitely something that does happen so you don't value it till you pay for it yes and so the payment that we give for these classes are not very high compared to the prices teachings we receive and once you receive it and once you understand it i personally feel uh, we need to give a lot more yes and uh, that that comes automatically out of the person and and goes towards the school of the teacher yeah How does the Kundalini awakening affect the evolution of the astral and mental body? Uh, the awakening of the Kundalini is basically got to do with you and I spiritually evolving. And if you want to spiritually evolve, you can't just evolve just with uh, sadhana or meditation. You have to go through yama and yamas. You have to purify yourself on a regular basis. Only then your sadhana will be beneficial. Yes. And so for the ultimate samadhi that you want in life, you then should have done enough purification to allow this this vehicle, not just the physical, but my emotional and mental vehicle to become pure enough. So my transition upwards, going back to the causal body will be the shortest and um, it'll be the most beneficial. And I can stay in the causal body then for a longer period of time. Uh, people see sparkles of light or uh, golden sparks. Are they uh, necessary angels? Uh, well, I'm not too sure. It really depends. It could be your own aura where you can feel the energy flowing down, the divine energy, and it looks like sparkles. Uh, it could be uh, just the energy, even if it's not in your aura yet, it's around you, surrounding you. So it could be golden. Now, there are times when Master Cho was around, uh, sometimes the energy that came through actually smelled like either jasmine, uh, that's my personal experience, or it smelled like uh, sandalwood. Yes. So the divine energy didn't only have, like you said, sparkle or color, it also had smell. And so that could also be something that you might realize when you are doing usually group uh, kind of meditations. Yeah. Okay, people, um, I cannot continue with this. I, I really feel bad that I didn't expect so many questions. I know there's a whole bunch of you. Um, but remember, you and I have also responsibilities with our family. And so I'd like you to also take the time to go and spend time with your family, time for dinner almost for all of us. Yes. Uh, now, please, please do whatever you like to help others. Yeah. Whether it's animals here, uh, birds, uh, other humans, when you're feeding them, do it out of the goodness of your heart without expecting anything in return. Do you have to decree for that? If you've done it out of the goodness of your heart, then they are keeping account. Yes. No act of uh, love, especially. Uh, unselfish love will go unnoticed. Yes, it, they have a complete record. They are the best chartered accountants that we know of. They keep account of everything that you have done, <laughs> right? And so don't worry about uh, decreeing it. It will come back to you. But if you do tithing, please do decree for it. That would be very, very essential. That's as far as I know. And like I said, um, please, please try and uh, do this on a regular basis. Yes. Okay, people, I'm going to wind up now. It's time to close. So kindly close your eyes. Inhale and exhale. Relax your body. Be aware of all that you have learned today. Save it so you may always remember it now and beyond. Let's give a thanksgiving prayer to the Supreme Being, the Divine Father, Divine Mother, to our beloved and respected teacher, Grand Master Chua Koksui, to Lord Maha Guruji Nele, without whom these teachings wouldn't be as simple and easy to understand, to comprehend, and to discuss. To all the great beings of Theosophy, the Masters, the teachers, to Buddha Kuan Yin, Buddha Sakyamuni, Gautama Buddha, to Lord Christ, to Yehoshua Ba Miriam, to Lord Shiva, Lord Ganesha, all the great beings and host of angels of knowledge, light and power. Thank you all for your great, great blessings. Thank you for your tremendous patience in helping us have a deeper and clearer understanding 
of your priceless teachings. We ask you to help us to make this part of us, to take these teachings deep into ourselves, to use it to become better divine instruments and to be of service to you. We humbly offer ourselves as instruments to do your work with thanks and in full faith. So be it, so be it, so be it, so it is. Be aware of the energy coming down into you. Inhale, exhale, release it to your family, to your friends. Share it with them, smile at them. Thank them for allowing you to be out here for almost one and a half hours. Inhale, exhale, share it with everybody who's connected and who might connect later. Inhale, exhale, share it with the whole globe. Slowly open your eyes with a smile. Thank you, everybody. Atma, namaste. I'll see you tomorrow at 6.30. 6 o'clock, we'll be doing the meditation on Twin Hearts to Bless the Earth, uh, your country and your state. And then we'll resume here at 6.30. Yes? So see you with Chapter 7. Have a good dinner. Bon appetit. Okay, stopping that live stream. Thank you, everybody. You should go and have time with your family now. We have already got a good karma by having. Yes, when you give your tax donations or you do your tax uh, um, payments, if, if there is a donation that you have and you're using ATG, for example, uh, ATG, that benefit, that tax benefit takes care of part of your good karma. So if you want all the good karma, then you don't uh, provide these tax receipts. Yes, because getting the rebate is already uh, using up part of your good karma. So it's up to you if you want to do that or not. Thank you, everybody, for all your thank yous. Appreciate it. Someone smelled jasmine when she was pregnant with her daughter. I hope it was all throughout, all the nine months. Fabulous. Okay. All right, people. That's a wrap for now. Thank you so much. Uh, for those of you who want uh, to see the earlier one, you can go back to the earlier recordings. Uh, Pawan has uh, given this at uh, 6.49. So if you go through the chat, you can find that. Yep. So enjoy yourselves. Take care. I'll see you tomorrow, 6.30, reincarnation. <laughs> Bye, everybody.